Welcome back. Today we're going to look at another branch of engineering called thermodynamics and we're going to just touch on some of the very basic aspects of thermodynamics. Now thermo immediately sounds like something to do with temperature and one could possibly say that thermodynamics is to do with temperature of objects but there's way more to it than that and here's a bit of a definition the which says that thermodynamics is the branch of physical science that deals with the relations between heat and other forms of energy, and they list them, and by extension of the relationships between all forms of energy. So really it's all about the energy of substances and how these energies trade between each other, etc., etc. And it's not just about temperature. Temperature would be a, one of the parameters we're going to deal with. We're also going to deal with pressure, volume, and all sorts of other parameters. Right, to kick off, we're going to start by defining closed and open systems. And let's start with the closed system. A system is defined as a quantity of matter. I've underlined that, that's important, matter. Or a region in space chosen for study. The mass or region outside the system is known as the surroundings. Okay, that makes sense. The real or imaginary surface that separates the system from its surroundings is called the boundary. Okay, we're going to talk a lot more about the boundary in a bit. The boundary can be fixed or movable, as we're going to see. Now, here it comes. In a closed system, no mass or matter can cross the boundary, but energy can. So, as an example, let's consider a cylinder with a tight-fitting piston. Frictionless, but with a perfect seal. Okay, so the blue is the piston, it's round obviously, and the cylinder is round, and the piston would rise and fall as the pressure changed in this volume down here. Okay, so let's make a few definitions here, or we'll look at a few quantities. First of all, it's going to be a closed system, clearly no matter can enter or leave this space here, and around the area we're going to have the red dotted line which indicates the boundary of the area of interest for us and here in the first instance the closed system contains matter or mass of two kilograms and it happens to have a volume of one cubic meter right here okay now we light a fire for example underneath this cylinder now we all know what's going to happen as you heat the gas in here it increases in volume pressure tries to increase but in this case it can't because the, the piston simply rises and the same closed system with that same amount of mass or matter inside in other words the two kilograms is now sitting at a volume of three cubic meters okay so that would be an example of a closed system the closed system did however receive energy through the boundary. As you can see the fire heated the cylinder walls and the energy moved through the boundary and entered into the closed system. So that follows our little definition over here which said that no mass can cross the boundary, it didn't, but certainly energy did come in from the fire that was underneath the cylinder. Now in an open system sometimes called a control volume, mass as well as energy can cross the boundary. As an example, let's consider one of these old-fashioned water geysers, sometimes called a donkey, where you essentially light a fire under a vessel and you pump water in and water exits. Obviously the water is hotter when it leaves. This would be exactly what we were talking about, an open system. Consider the water geyser depicted below. Both mass and energy enter and exit the control volume. Okay, so obviously that's a little bit more complicated than the closed one. So to recap, in a closed system, no mass can cross the boundary, but energy can. In an open system or control volume, both mass and energy enter and exit the volume. 
Now we'll be using the word state quite often and state is simply a set of properties that define the condition of a system. Okay, now here are some of the properties, not necessarily all, but in this particular system, we are saying that there is two kilograms of matter or mass in the area, and the temperature happens to be 20 degrees C over here, and the volume happens to be one and a half cubic meters. Okay, and here is the same system, still with the two kilograms of mass, still happens to be at 20 degrees C and the volume is now increased. So that would simply be the state or condition of a system defined by those properties. We'll also see the word equilibrium used here and there and that is simply a question of the system being stable. Okay, the wording is when there are no driving forces present to change any of the conditions. So in other words, the temperature is not busy changing or the pressure is not busy changing. In other words, all conditions are pretty stable and balanced. Now a system can go from equilibrium to another state of equilibrium. Okay, and in both cases be in equilibrium. But this change from one state of equilibrium to another is going to be called a process. Now here's an example of a process. We have the same piston cylinder arrangement and we have a closed system depicted by this boundary over here. And on the right hand side we have a graph that is plotting pressure versus volume, PV diagram in other words. And at position 1, which is when the piston is down here, we have a large volume. As you can see we're on the far right of this graph. And then we apply a force to the piston and as can be imagined we squeeze that volume into a smaller space thereby increasing the pressure. So point 2 is at a higher pressure and a lesser volume. Now the route that we took to get from here to here from point 1 to point 2 is called the process path and we are undergoing a process. Okay, so that's another word that you've got to get used to. And this example would be an example of a closed system process. Closed system. Remember, closed system is one where matter does not enter or leave the system, but certainly energy can. In this case, the energy came from mechanical work being done on the piston. Now we move on to specific heats. Now, probably in your school studies, you were taught that the specific heat of water was 4198 joules per kilogram Kelvin. Now remember what that was. That was the energy required to raise the temperature by one degree for that water. Now when we talk about gas, the same idea applies, but it's a little bit more complicated. Okay, so there are two ways of looking at this. Depending on how the process is executed, the value varies. Okay, now if you are raising the temperature of one kilogram of the substance but maintaining constant volume throughout. Okay, there's a way that one can do that. We'll talk about that in a moment. But then the value would be referred to as C subscript V. Okay, which would be specific heat at constant volume. Conversely, if you were doing exactly the same thing but maintaining constant pressure, it would yield a different value. Okay, so we're going to have CV and CP used extensively, and the two differ. CP is always greater than CV, okay, and the reason for that is extra work is required to expand the gas. Okay, so just remember at this stage that CP is the greater of the two. And in fact, the difference between the two, CP being the greater, is equal to CV, which is the lesser, plus this new value we're going to talk about now called R. Now this value R, better known as the gas constant, whose units would also be kilojoules per kilogram Kelvin, varies quite extensively. And here's a little table. Let's start with air. R is 0 0.287 
joules per kilogram Kelvin. In fact, that's the first one in the list over here. And then there are lots of other gases that you can see all the way down here. So keep this table handy. We're going to need it again. Just let's recap what it is. What is R? R is this value here, which is essentially the difference between CP and CV. What is CP and CV? CV was the energy to raise the temperature of one kilogram of the substance whilst volume is maintained constant. Okay, so just imagine that the volume does not change whilst you are raising the temperature by one degree C. Conversely, CP, the energy to raise the temperature of one kilogram of the substance whilst maintaining pressure. Which one is bigger? CP. By how much? By value R. Now the exact specific heats for different substances are listed over here. Remember which is the bigger? CP is always bigger than CV. And here are CP and CV values at a particular temperature. So this is quite complicated in that the values themselves change at different temperatures. And here is an extract of values at one temperature, namely 300 Kelvin or 27 degrees C. Okay, so there's air, for example, CP 1.005, CV 0.718, CV being less than CP. Take oxygen as an example, 0.918 CP and a lesser value of CV of 0.658. For any other temperatures, you will need to look at a more extensive table. Right, now we get to this big word, enthalpy denoted by capital H in our studies. Now this one scares a lot of learners because the definition is a little bit wishy-washy if you look at this one over here. But let's start with what Wikipedia says about this new term enthalpy. Maybe it'll be a good starting point because it's put nice and simply. Enthalpy comprises a system's internal energy. Okay, so enthalpy's got something to do with internal energy which is the energy required to create the system okay so that's the energy possessed by the matter but wait for it plus the amount of work required to make room for it by displacing its environment and thereby establishing its volume and its pressure so if you wish to have a parcel of gas in the room right in front of where you're sitting now not only do you need to create it or obtain it and thus know that it has internal energy, you also have to push air out of the way to create its environment. Now enthalpy caters for all of the energy, not just the energy possessed by the matter, but also the fact that you had to get it to where it is and displace the surroundings, which takes work. So it's a little bit abstract. But we need to get comfortable with, with what this enthalpy term is. So a slightly more formal definition would be the following. When studying certain thermodynamic systems, it is often convenient to deal with the sum of two quantities, U and PV, PV being the product of pressure and volume. The resultant combination quantity is simply referred to as enthalpy. Okay, so the definition doesn't say too much other than it is the sum of U and PV. So enthalpy is H equals internal energy plus the product of pressure and volume. Remember that was the energy required to create the space or the environment for that substance to live. Now here we for the first time see capital letters and lowercase letters. And lowercase simply means per unit mass. So that will simply be all the quantities will be per kilogram. Whereas here we are dealing with totals when we have capitals. So we're going to use that a few times. Capitals is total and lowercase is per unit mass, per kilogram of the substance we're dealing with. So the letters we use, capital U, total internal energy, the units would be kilojoules. Lowercase u is the specific internal energy, which as we said moments ago, kilojoules per kilogram, it's per unit mass. So it follows that capital U is equal to 
lowercase u multiplied by the mass that you're dealing with. Now remember a short while ago we looked at specific heats and there were two different types as you may recall CV and CP. Now is the moment where we show which we use where and how. If we are dealing with CV the change in energy remember U is internal energy is CV times the change in temperature which kind of makes sense. If on the other hand we take the bigger number remember which was the bigger one CP we then are dealing with change in H remember what H is enthalpy either in specific terms per kilogram or total enthalpy. Okay so this is vital if we are dealing with a change in internal energy we've got to use CV. If we are dealing with a change in enthalpy we must use CP. Remember which is bigger? CP is bigger and it makes sense because this value is bigger than this value. By how much? By this much. Remember the product of pressure and volume. Right, here's a bit of a summary of the various terms, some of which we've dealt with so far and some of which are still coming. Keep it handy, we're going to be referring back to this in a short while. Next is to identify what an ideal gas is. An ideal gas is a theoretical gas that obeys the ideal gas laws, which is a simplified equation of state. Okay, so we're going to be looking at that and using the ideal laws in many cases. And in fact, many gases such as nitrogen, oxygen and hydrogen and a few others like CO2 can be treated like ideal gases within reasonable tolerances. Okay, so it might not be absolutely precise, but in many cases it is okay to treat them using the ideal gas laws. And here is the ideal gas equation of state. PV equals MRT. What that means is if you know some of the parameters of a particular parcel of ideal gas, you can find others. For example, pressure times volume of the parcel of ideal gas is equal to its mass times R. Now remember what that was, the gas constant which we saw in a previous table, 0.287 for air, times the temperature. And remember, whenever you multiply a temperature straight into a formula, such as this one, it has to be in Kelvin. So that's useful in an example such as this one here, where they say determine the mass of air in a room of 4 meters by 5 meters by 6 meters. Obviously, you can get the volume from that. And they give you the pressure, it's 100 kilopascals, and the temperature at 25 degrees C. Using this formula above, which is the ideal gas equation of state, we can find the mass. Make M the subject of the equation, which leaves you with pressure times volume over R times T. Pressure, 100 kilopascals. Volume, 4 meters by 5 meters by 6 meters. Below the line, 0.287 times 10 to the 3. Remember, that was the R value for air times the temperature in Kelvin, 25 degrees C, plus 273 to bring it to Kelvin. Solves out at 140,3 kilograms mass of air in that room. Now if we take that a step further and we use PV equals MRT for a closed system, which is moving from one state to, a, to another, you can make MR the subject of the equation remembering that the mass and the R value for a substance in a closed system is not going to change as it changes state. Therefore, if MR is the same before and after an event or a change of state, then the following will hold true. If MR is PV over T, then the first set of PV over T values must equal the second set of PV over T values. In other words, P1 V1 over T1 is P2 V2 over T2, where 1 is the initial state and 2 the final state. Next is the first law of thermodynamics, which says that energy can neither be created or destroyed, it can only change forms, and hence for a closed system, 
changing between two states, it simply means that the change in total energy of the system is equal to the energy entering the system minus the energy leaving the system. Okay, and here's the important part, or the lucky part. The actual value of the total energy is not necessarily required to be known. So you don't necessarily need the actual value here or here. You are often just interested in this change in energy. Okay, so let's describe that via a little example. And we are given an example that says during a process, a closed system, there it is, receives 15 kilojoules of heat. So there could be a flame under here or some other source of heat. It gives up 3 kilojoules of heat. There it is. Maybe it's lost to the surroundings. And has 6 kilojoules of mechanical work performed on it. Calculate the total change in energy during the process. Well, according to the first law, it says change in energy equals energy that came in minus energy that went out. Now, energy coming in, we were told 15 kilojoules came in here. 6 kilojoules came in as work done, perhaps a shaft turning an impeller. It is work done on the substance inside here. Minus that which was lost, probably to the surroundings, leaves you with a total change of 18 kilojoules positive. Now, in that previous example, it was fairly easy to understand the flow of energy because it was a fixed volume and there was simply energy coming in, energy going out, and it was a simple bit of arithmetic to sort that out. However, if we now have a boundary, if one or more of these edges of this closed system can move, then there's going to be work done, either inwards or outwards. So in a closed system with a boundary that can move, there will be work done if that boundary moves as a result of pressure acting upon it. Okay, so there's going to be a number of examples where one of the boundaries can move. For example, a piston in a cylinder. For example, a balloon that inflates under pressure, etc. We're going to have to look at the work done to move that boundary. So if we go back to basics for a moment, you may recall from basic mechanics that work done is force times distance. And if we take that square or rectangular box, if you want to call it that, that we had in the previous example, and we consider that pressure is force over area, and hence force is pressure times area, so whatever pressure is acting on one of those walls of this box, multiplied by the area would give us force, and at the same time, volume is distance times area, so distance moved, that would be this one, this is now assuming this boundary over here is going to move from left to right as a result of the pressure acting on it. How far will it move? Well, distance is volume over area. So if we take that and say work done is force times distance. Here's the force, there's the distance. Distance came from there, force came from there. Obviously the areas cancel out and we are left with pressure times volume. So, to simplify, for a process where pressure stays constant, notice that, a constant pressure process, and just the volume changes, the boundary work will simply be pressure, whatever it is, remember it stays constant, times the change in volume. Another way of putting it would be final pressure times final volume minus initial pressure times initial volume. That should be a one. Looking at that graphically, the process going from 1 to 2, and we draw it out on a PV graph, and remembering that we are talking constant pressure, so the pressure did not change between here and here, so the graph would simply look like that, it would be flat, and the boundary work would in fact be P2 V2 minus P1 V1, which would be this area over here. How do we get to that? Well, P2V2 would be this entire area here. And if you subtract from it P1V1, you would remove that piece and you'll be left with a shaded area. So boundary work under constant pressure is P2V2 minus P1V1. And logically, if the process 
is occurring under varying pressure, things get a little bit more complicated and the graph would look something like this, again 1 to 2, but now the area, the shaded area is as we've shown here and more than likely it's not going to be a straight line between those two, so to get the area you would have to integrate. So under varying pressure the boundary work is a little bit more complicated. So now to apply all of this in an example. And what we have is a piston in a cylinder and initially the volume is half a cubic meter of nitrogen gas. The pressure is 400 kilopascals, absolute pressure, remember absolute and gauge pressure, we've got absolute here. And the temperature is 27 degrees C initially. Now an electric heater within the device is turned on, a little bit like a geyser element, something like that. You'll see the sketch in a moment and is allowed to pass a current of 2 amps for 5 minutes from a 120 volt source. So clearly there is energy going in heating up the nitrogen. The nitrogen, or should I rather say adding energy to the nitrogen. The nitrogen expands at constant pressure due to the weight of the piston being constant and the ability of the piston to move freely in the cylinder. So what we have there is a cylinder that rises as the volume increases and because the weight of the cylinder is constant, the pressure stays constant inside the system, which is useful for our concept here because it's going to keep it as a constant pressure uh, process. Right, during the process, 2,800 joules of heat is lost from the system. That's probably radiating to the atmosphere from around the device. And we've got to determine the final temperature as well as the volume of the nitrogen finally. We're given the gas constant for nitrogen and the CP value. So there's what the system looks like. There is the piston which can rise and fall freely but because its weight is constant it will maintain the same pressure at all times in this nitrogen. There's the heat leaving to the surroundings that's lost from the system and here is the electrical current entering 2 amps at 120 volts through some sort of resistive element thereby putting energy into the nitrogen. Let's start by working out the electrical work done on the nitrogen. Now remember from your electrical studies power is volts times amps so 120 volts at 2 amps is 240 watts or 240 joules per second and the process ran for five minutes they tell us which is 300 seconds so 72 kilojoules of electrical work was done on the nitrogen next step is to work out what quantity of nitrogen we are dealing with in other words what is its mass and remember the formula PV equals MRT we can use make M the subject and we have pressure given as 400 kilopascals absolute times the initial volume which was 0.5 cubic meters over the R value for nitrogen multiplied by the temperature in degrees Kelvin. So 2.246 kilograms of nitrogen is what is in the container. Now just back to this summary briefly. We have a closed system where potential energy and kinetic energy is not varying so the change in internal energy is in fact the change in total energy. Okay, that's going to make things slightly simpler for us. Now if for a moment we use the standard energy equation from mechanics which says that energy after an event is the energy before plus whatever you gained minus what you lost, you can use it in this instance as well. Because of the above, which we've just been through, the change in total energy is the same as the change in internal energy because of the fact that it's a closed system so internal energy after final equals internal energy before plus heat that came in plus work that came in minus heat that went out minus work done to the surroundings okay so what do we have in our case U final minus U initial is what went in, what went out, plus work that was done, which in our case was the electrical work done on the gas. We worked that out already. And here is the new one to us. This is because one of the boundaries 
could move. So this is boundary work, work done to move one of the boundaries. Which boundary is that? Well, remember that the piston is free to rise and therefore this boundary is going to move upwards under the influence of the nitrogen inside it. So that is something that's got to go into the balance of the energy equation because it takes work to move that boundary. How much work? Well, under a constant pressure situation, a few moments ago, we concluded that that would be the boundary work. And the other values you can get from the question, they were given. And this one, in fact, you worked out. So you can get the equation to this point here. And now it's handy to rearrange it a little bit. You're going to see why in a moment. If you can somehow rearrange the equation to get u plus pv on its own, some magic's going to happen because u plus pv, if you go back to the definition of enthalpy, that is precisely what it is. And enthalpy we can do something else with in a moment. So let's see if we can rearrange it like that. u plus pv, there it is, u plus pv, that's looking good. But u plus pv is enthalpy. Okay, so you can replace U2 plus P2V2 with enthalpy 2, and you can replace U1 plus P1V1 with enthalpy 1. So the change in enthalpy, therefore, is 69,200 joules, but we know that change in enthalpy is, in fact, MCP delta T. Remember which one goes with enthalpy? CP goes with enthalpy. So 69,200 equals the mass, we've got that already, we've got Cp, and we would like to know delta T. Okay, and you can then solve for delta T, or rather for T2 as being 329.65 Kelvin. Subtract the 273 to get back to degrees C, and there you've got one of your answers. Final volume was also asked for. So you can simply substitute that back in and find that the final volume is now 0.549 cubic meters. Right, we're going to end off this video with this little example, which I'm going to leave you to do. And what we have is a 200 millimeter diameter piston with a mass of 1.2 kilograms. That's this piston here. Fits into a 200 millimeter diameter cylinder and seals completely. So there's no leakage past the sides here. Now we place a 5 kilogram mass on top of the piston, there it is there. Assume that the piston can move freely in the cylinder, so we have no friction between the walls of the cylinder and the piston. The piston is initially 250 millimeters from the base of the cylinder as shown. The cylinder contains argon and the walls of the cylinder are well insulated. So we'll assume that all of this is well insulated, such that heat loss can be neglected during the process. So no heat being lost. That'll make it nice and easy. Initially, the temperature of the argon is 20 degrees C. That's here. Now we have a paddle wheel. The paddle wheel is then started and runs at a steady speed of 500 revs per minute. So here's a shaft. There's a seal. And this paddle wheel is rotating at 500 revs per minute. The torque going in is 3 newton meters. Atmospheric pressure is 100 kilopascals. You must find a few things. Initial pressure of the argon, how much argon we have, what's the mass, how long the paddle wheel must run for the piston to rise 450 to 450 millimeters. So the paddle wheel is going to turn, energy is going into the argon, argon is going to expand under, here's a clue, constant pressure thanks to this device, and this 250 is going to increase, increase until it gets to 450. We need to know how long that's going to take. And also, what's the final temperature of the argon? And you're given a few constants. Okay, give that a go. Good luck with it.